in rare uh, dynamical states, uh, in resonances, that might tell you about the pathways of, of uh, that, that these objects take as they move through the solar system and end up in, in, in inner uh, solar system orbits. Um, and and the, the uh, interstellar objects, um, we're redoing some of these estimates, but if we don't find at least one per year, it puts an interesting constraint. Um, this is, if, if these two that, that were discovered over the last two years are, are any indication there are going to be a few of these per year. So this is going to be really fun because think about what we're getting. We're measuring the population of ejected, effectively, you know, comets and asteroids. So you can think of these as, as um, uh, uh, protoplanetary, uh, not protoplanetary, uh, planetesimal type bodies that were ejected from, uh, from other stars. And so we're getting, we're getting a chance to, to understand, see and understand that population. And there's a really interesting European mission called Comet Interceptor where it's right now it's being in the, in the proposal stage, where the idea is to park an interceptor into, into one of these dynamically unstable points in the solar system from which it's easy to get anywhere. And then as soon as an interesting object shows up, you launch towards it. Because for these guys, you have to be able to react on one time scales. So comet interceptor, the most likely um, destination is a comet just from our own warp cloud. However, if, if we get one of these that's on the proper orbit and that, uh, that's, that's close enough, um, you, know, you can imagine having an encounter with, with, with that object, and that would be phenomenal. We'd have in-situ measurements of an, of an extrasolar um, um, protobody. Um, and and then this, this is just uh, what I already told you, that uh, these are, this is the discovery rate for main belt asteroids, and you see that in the first year, second year, third year, we essentially find everything. It's, and this is just the synodic period of, of the Earth. So we, we do one lap and change, and we've, we've recovered almost all of it. So this is fun stuff. If you're doing dark energy, you should forget dark energy for about five years. <laughs> and then you know, come do solar system, and come back to dark energy. <laughs> so all the hazards, the asteroids, potentially, you know, just like you want to kill the dinosaurs. Uh, down to which size will you be able to know about all of uh, we'll know for about, uh, we'll get to about 70% if you combine LSST and other surveys. Uh, we'll get to about 70% of the population for uh, 130 meters and larger. 130? 130 meters, okay. yeah. Um, and, and then uh, there's that, that kind of drops off somewhat dramatically uh, below. That 130, 140 meter uh, size is, is sort of the, the magic number because it's, a, it's, it's the size at which you have a regional level destruction if one of those actually impacted the Earth. So, so Congress mandated uh, about a decade ago that 90% of those be found uh, by a month ago. So it's similar to the 100 meters is similar to the nuclear explosion. Oh, many, much, much worse. Much more. Significantly bigger. Yeah, the, the 20 meter one that, that blew up above Chelyabinsk uh, was uh, a uh, few tens of kilotons. It was, uh, I hate to use this comparison, but I don't know any others. Uh, it was about 20 times the Hiroshima uh, explosion. So, so it would still be quite dangerous. But oh, so those that we don't see, but uh, not, not devastate. Yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, right. it's, it's, a, it's a kind of risk mitigation, it's a, it's a risk reduction strategy from the point of view of planetary defense. We, we started about 20 years ago with kilometer sized objects, now about 90% of those are known. Those, those are dinosaur type events. And then you're, you're trying to come down to these about 100 meter objects, those are regional, and then you, you start going down uh, down that list. And it, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic kind of about all the interesting issues when you start going down that list because you start getting into the regime where, where um, these asteroids might have, for example, very regional, like citywide impact. So what kind of a decision do you do based on incomplete information that this asteroid might hit in this region? What happens if you know that 10 years in advance? What does that do to property values in, in that region? You may actually have a bigger disaster because people start worrying um, and try to you know, do rational things than you would have if, um, if, if, if you kind of waited until you had the capacity to remove that, to, to move that asteroid off course. So it's, this is way beyond my pay grade, but it's the kind of thing that the policy, uh, where, where policy issues come in. It's, it's, Fascinating. All, all these things we don't think about as scientists. 
Um, all right, so, so I hope this, this, uh, this got you interested in, in the, the dark matter of our solar system, um, the asteroids. Uh, but now what I'm going to do for the last couple of minutes is I want to talk about can we do even better than this. Um, so this is the, the plot that I showed you that, that Matt had, uh, had in his paper a couple of years ago. And, and I think I, I just realized that this is the difference between how Matt and I think about these things. Right? Matt sees this and says, I found an efficient algorithm. I don't need a cluster anymore. I see that and say, if I'm an efficient algorithm, how do I keep the cluster busy? <laughs> uh, so what if, you know, the, the, the great thing about this is that you know the velocity of the asteroid at every point. So once you have this line, this is just a simple transformation. This is one you know, multiplication and addition to get them clustered. But what if you didn't know the velocity? What if all you had was just the location like individual points that that might be um, that might be along the line, and then you try to assume all possible velocities to actually try to make that linkage. Right? So that's naively speaking, n squared additional n squared of work, but it allows you not to construct traplets. It allows you to make your telescope not to have to go back twice a night. So with this, we save the telescope from going back three or four times a night. Can we save it from going back um, once a night? And so this is the idea behind an algorithm that uh, one of our students, Joachim Moyens, has been, has been working on. Um, and the, the logic here is, is this. Um, we, we take the solar system. If you imagine, if you think about the solar system, there are asteroids that move on orbits. Um, in, in the sky, we only see individual observations. So what we, instead, what we do is we say, let's assume that there's an object on some orbit in the solar system, and let's see how that object would move. And then let's transform the observations that we have on the sky into a co-rotating frame with that orbit. So if we happen to have the observations that are right on that orbit, if I guessed that there's, a, there's, a, there's an asteroid on, if I, if I guessed the right orbit for an asteroid, all the observations of that asteroid will cluster essentially to the origin point in that, in that co-rotating frame. But for objects that are nearby, that are adjacent to the orbit over a short period of time, what would those do? Well, from the co-rotating frame, it's like you know, driving a car on the highway. You would see the cars next to you kind of moving slowly past by you, or either you know, going backwards or forwards. And that's exactly what you expect to see here. So these little lines are asteroids that are on, on orbits that are adjacent in phase space to the orbits that I've chosen. So I've effectively linearized the problem. Once I've chosen orbit, did this transformation. Now everything that's in a, in a neighborhood around the chosen orbit, um, I can actually pick out if I can pick out lines. And we have pretty good algorithms for picking out lines from data sets. So this is what one of those, um, and this is supposed to be a movie, let me see what it's. Uh, this is what uh, what one of the, what those what that algorithm uh, does. This may have been a huge mistake. Whoa. Mm -hmm. uh, go back. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> uh, this is what this is what uh, what one of the, what that algorithm does. I'm not going to try to make this movie play for uh, obvious reasons. We call the trapless heliocentric orbit recovery. Um, as you can tell, it spells out Thor. Um, it's uh, it's the, the idea is to stop. Um, <laughs> the idea is to 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 be able to to uh, grid the, the the phase space with enough orbits to pick out most of the objects uh, that that we see in there. And if you ask yourself, like, why do we call it Thor? Just want to point out that Jane here is an astrophysicist, and like our Thor, uh, Thor in the first movie was a useful tool. Uh, <laughs> okay, so does this work? Uh, we ran this on the Zwicky Transit Facility data set. We took a two week period. Um, this is about 0.1 LSST. This is how I want you to think about it. This is what, one, what two weeks of data with, LS, with uh, ZTF looks like. So it's the entire sky and then some. The, the little dots are the locations of uh, reference points for, for the orbits that, that were picked. Um, 
these are actual observations. The blue ones, the, the gray dots, are the, uh, uh, the distribution of asteroids in the asteroid belt from, from the catalog. And what we find with that, as a, uh, sorry, yeah. How many detections are in that? Uh, uh, 280,000. Uh, 280,000 detections. Uh, and so what we did was we, out of those 280,000 detections, we know which ones are already known. Um, and, and we can see how well we recover the already known objects. Uh, and we find that we recover 95.6% of them. Uh, and the, the effectiveness of that recovery changes uh, as a function of, the dist of, their, of their distance in the solar system. We're not very good uh, in the inner solar system yet because there you need to grid the, 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 the space with a lot more orbits than you need to do in the outer solar system and wanted to, to do this first as a proof of concept and did not, did not really work this out yet. What are those black things? Oh, those are the, this is the detection efficiency, so gold is good. Um, purple is, is not good, so these are the ones that we missed. So you can tell that there are many more uh, dark, dark regions in this part of the solar system than, than out here. Once we get to out of to, to five AU or so, it's it, it gets almost to hundred percent. And then the, the interesting bit to me was that if I compare it to what would we find with classical MOPS or with Z mode, which is an improved algorithm that ZTF uses right now, so in this population uh, we recover sixty six point four percent with Z mode and only forty four percent with, with classical MOPS. So this is really can make a, a factor of, of you know, one and a half or so difference. Um, deploying this on, uh, on an existing data set. And the interesting thing is that we also find new ones. Uh, 